I think we will go ahead and begin. Warmest welcome. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for a conversation about building the future through alumni insights and input, thinking about the value we deliver in our organizations. My name is Ruth Watkins. I'm the president of Strata Impact. I've been that for a very short amount of time, six or so weeks right now. And before that, I was the president of the University of Utah, the provost at Utah before that. And I came to Utah eight years ago from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where I was the Dean of Arts and Sciences. It's a delight to be with you today. So I'm gonna provide just a little bit of very brief context for this discussion, and then we'll get on to the substance uh, in every important way. In terms of context, what does Strata do and who is Strata? Strata is thinking about the role of all of us in moving beyond completion. What do I mean by moving beyond completion? I think we are talking about education to employment pathways and really sharpening a focus on what happens in post-secondary ed that helps students move from education to employment successfully with the economic mobility and upward trajectory that we hope we deliver and that happens. Now, historically, we focused for a very long time in post-secondary education on access. Access, of course, is vital and it remains vital. That is not a problem that's been solved, but we also know that access without completion is a hollow promise. Completion, the last decades or so, have we've all focused on completion, the importance of, of completion, given its association with employment, with stability and economic mobility. I think we now know, and we are certainly seeing through the pandemic, that completion alone does not guarantee the positive outcomes we hope that post-secondary ed can deliver. That we need to think beyond completion, beyond completion to employment that offers stability and economic mobility, to employment that offers meaningful work and engaged life and all the benefits that go with a completion of a post-secondary credential. So a bit of the framework that we are talking about today is how the field can move toward embracing beyond completion as a goal that we can all share <coughs> with the prerequisite goals of access and completion being essential feeders into a movement beyond completion. The, the premise of this discussion today is that feedback from our graduates can help us better understand how well we're delivering beyond completion, where we have strength and where we have areas where we want to improve. The perspectives and input from our students, learners, graduates will help us do better with alumni insights. So that's a little bit of the framework today. I have looked at some of the national data that Strata Impact has collected, um, not individual institutional data, but broad uh, national survey with a large number of responses. There are some striking findings about uh, be moving beyond completion and enjoying the full benefits of a post-secondary credential that uh, really got my attention. Certainly uh, the positive benefits beyond completion are not equally shared by everyone. And I think they may, these insights really can help us think about what higher ed ought to do in the next decade or so to sharpen and improve what we're delivering for our learners and our society. Um, I also want to just give a little context about where we're going today. So what's happening next? And we're going to take a little bit of a look at some of the national data and begin to think about implications on how graduates are doing, where there's successes and where there are challenges. Uh, then we have the great privilege of having a moderated panel with three leaders of prominent uh, institutions of higher education, chancellors and presidents. We're going to talk a little bit about their perspectives on insights and input from graduates, how they can be valuable and why they're interested in um, understanding better how alums are faring. Then our next opportunity is to hear a little bit about a case study of an institution that has done this for a little bit and is thinking about using alum perspectives and insights for institutional improvement and change. And one of our great hopes today is that everybody who's participating and listening has the opportunity to learn and to think a little bit about how institutional change can be tweaked and perfected to 
uh, really use and reflect on the outcomes that our graduates are uh, achieving, the areas of strength, the areas of challenge, and how these perspectives of our graduates can be used as another tool in the toolkit to help uh, build a more effective post-secondary institution for all of society. So that's a little bit of context. A few um, requests from us would be, we will have opportunities for discussion, dialogue, and questions um, towards the end of the session. And we've tried to leave a fair amount of time for that. We would love it if you would um, participate visually and uh, join by video so that we can see you. And we'd also really appreciate it if you would rename yourself to add your institutional affiliation so that we have a little context on where you're from. I think you can, um, we're going to ask uh, people who have questions to um, participate too, so that we hear your voice and really make sure that we're capturing your question correctly. Uh, so there will be an opportunity to do that. You're also very welcome to use the chat function if that's a more comfortable and easy way for you to participate. So thank you all so much. Special thanks to our panelists who are willing to join us today and help us lead this discussion. I'm going to turn now to Dave Clayton. Dave is a senior vice president uh, at Strata Impact. And we are very happy to have Dave give a little bit of the context of how we got uh, the organization moving in this direction and a bit of perspective on how this all fits into the beyond completion agenda. Dave, we'll turn to you. Thank you, Ruth. And um, really thanks to all of you who are here. This is a meeting about you. And when we think about why we're here, it's because we're here together. Uh, with Strata, we've tried to be very intentional in doing this and even this setting where you can unmute your mic and you can ask questions and to see your faces and see one another and know who one another are. And this comes from three years ago. We did a landscape survey of the research instruments that were in the field, the Ruffalo Noel Levitts and the Custom Alumni, all the things that are available to you in different ways on your campus and Nessie, et cetera, to try and understand and have apples to apples, the ability with benchmarks and comparisons. And, and we visited with institutional leaders and what we really heard, maybe most formatively, there was an Ask You Regional Presence Symposium that we hosted in Indianapolis. And uh, as presidents and chancellors told us, education has more value beyond just getting a degree and it has value that goes beyond your first employment and your average wages and your lifetime earning. But we need to be able to document and understand that both to demonstrate our value to the state legislature and others who fund us as public institutions, but also to our faculty to help them understand and to our support services and to our alumni to help them know how they can be a part of building the future, not just their own lives, but giving to the next generation. And to those families and individuals who are choosing where to attend, helping them see value in multiple dimensions um, that occurs beyond completion of a degree, as Ruth articulated. And so we went about building tools that would help you, but beyond tools, we want to build a community and be of support to you in, I've always lamented in my career, research for research's sake doesn't do much, but research into action and research that gives leaders the ability to lead and create cohesion and collaboration, both on their campuses, but across the field is really what we've sought to do. So, you know, we've sponsored the development, some of you unbeknownst that we had sponsored, that we've heard in some of our discussions uh, of a career and workforce preparation module that was piloted on the Nessie survey for the first time this year, 102 schools participated. And we'll be sharing that data back with all of you and with the field in aggregate uh, this fall as it comes back. We also really took a hard look and developed our own alumni outcome survey, this education value survey. And my team teases me, it's my love of ice cream, but we had 31 flavors of schools uh, who participated last year with us and Ellen as a president at uh, CSU Stanislaus and Ruth as president of the University of Utah were two of those early pilot schools. And then this year, 33, Rutgers snuck, snuck in two satellite campuses or we would have had 31 flavors again this year. But just so appreciative that you would participate 
And our goal, again, is to help you connect with one another, to help you find ways to use these insights to improve your service to your students and future students. And then show with evidence-based and best practices, help those be visible to your peers and colleagues across the field. So that's what we're all about. And that's why you can unmute your microphone and turn your video on and start. This is not the once and done, but this is a community we hope to support in your efforts to serve students and to improve things. So thank you to those who will participate in formal roles in presenting, but also to those of you who will make I've taught class on campus, uh, many of you have. Uh, you need those students who will ask questions and who will chime in and who will make it real. Uh, otherwise, you're just reading their textbook to them. So um, thank you again. And thanks to my colleague, Nicole torpy -Sabo. Nicole is going to share her screen. And as Ruth said, we will highlight things from the national research each of you control the identification of your own participation in this work, and you absolutely control your own data. We will never reveal uh, that participation or your results. But we do, for this year, we added a national benchmark survey, and we'll continue to do that going forward. So you have some points of comparison for your work. Nicole, do you want to just, uh, it's been a, a learning, and let me just be transparent about some of the things we've learned okay. this year. I'll be over with you. How long are you going to be here today? And then maybe somebody just came off mute. Kylie, maybe you can just help that in the background uh, if you're not aware that you're off mute. Um, but we have 32 campuses. With you, we've surveyed 8,600 of your alumni who graduated, hold degrees, undergraduate degrees from the last 20 years. 15 large public, seven medium, eight public HBCUs and two online universities who are participating with you. So this data, aggregate data from the campuses is not what we'll be sharing today. That bottom benchmark of the 3,300 nationally representative uh, by a number of variables that we went out and surveyed independent. So these are representative of the college graduates across our nation the last 20 years. What has been a point of dismay, <laughs> and many of you have pitched in and trying to solve this and made extra efforts this spring, was the survey performance. It's just This was the fourth time we fielded the survey. We did it in the fall of 2019, spring of 2020, early winter or late, you know, February 2021, and then most of you here just recently in the spring. And the the survey yield and rates, you just have those numbers for reference, some of you who've been on the front lines, just varied widely in ways that we had not seen or experienced um, in the prior administration. Then everything we've looked at, that there's the COVID issues and the digital fatigue and people coming out. Um, so thank you for being partners in that and knowing we've worked hard to try to solve that and can help you afterwards and offline and individually if you have specific questions about what that's been like because many of you want to know about the validity and the quality and the quantity of data that you have to work with and so we've offered and extended the opportunity to have individual briefings with nicole and i about your own school results and so anything we can do to help you in that regard we will do but Nicole, after that preamble and fine print, let's turn to the big ideas and the fun things you found in the national survey and let yeah. you take over. Great. Um, so this has been, um, I mean, the whole project has been the fun part, but um, for us, it's always exciting to um, get that data and be able to have a little more insight into these questions that we've been asking, which is what does beyond completion look like? Because it's not something that's really been measured as much as some of those other outcomes about access and completion. And so um, we really look at three key indicators uh, for judging success beyond completion. And so these are the results that we got from that national benchmark study of alumni. We looked at whether they were earning an income of at least $40,000 a year. Um, that's been kind of a a ballpark figure that uh, some others, Georgetown Center and, and some others have been using, so we wanted to put that in there. Um, and then two subjective questions that we asked alumni. So was your education worth the cost? And that's something that we've been tracking on surveys for a number of years. And then another one about did your education help you to achieve your goals? 
And so we think it's important to hear directly from alumni as well as getting um, you know, more than the data about income, we wanna know their opinions and their feelings because in some cases we know that um, alumni might be very satisfied with their education and might not be working at the time or might you know, be working in a career that is paying less but still got a really valuable experience. So we think it's good to, to have those nuances. So we can see nationally that, um, you know, it came out pretty well. Three quarters of alumni were hitting those first two marks and then 80% of alumni with bachelor's degrees in the past 20 years said that their education had helped them to achieve their goals. Um, within the cohort, so if you look at your own results, um, there's a range both below and above this. And so, um, Again, we'll be sharing um, this deck and then also in the coming weeks, we'll have uh, access for you all to a dashboard, an interactive dashboard, to be able to take a deeper dive to look at your results compared to some of these national benchmarks. So the next thing that we wanted to ask was, well, these are the, the separate indicators, but what about whether or not people are achieving all three? And here um, we found that even though three quarters were achieving you know, those metrics individually, only about half were achieving all of them. Um, so that's lower than what we would hope for. And again, a, a big range within uh, the schools that are participating here. Um, and then we kind of looked underneath and it, it wasn't necessarily um, any, any particular weakness that, that stood out over any other. And so uh, our next question was really, well, what's underneath these and what drives success in these beyond completion outcomes? Um, oh, before we get into that, actually, we did wanna look at um, any kind of differences either by time, which is what you'll see here, and then as um, for different groups of alumni. So um, one thing that you know many of you have been astute in pointing out is that some of these indicators are gonna be different depending on when a student graduates. And so that's definitely what we see. No surprise, income in particular is sensitive to changes over time. So people who are one or two years out, a lot fewer of them are hitting that $40,000 uh, mark compared to alumni who have been out of school for longer. Um, and we also looked at um, differences. If I, if I, yeah. this line, there is great news for you because the worth the cost and help me achieve my goals, uh, those both stay high. They're between 70 and 80% across the board, even from the years out of graduation. So those indicators, and Nicole, on that previous slide, you don't need to go back, yeah. but you look at the absolute uh, affirmation from you know, 75, 80% of your alumni saying it, it was worth the cost, I would recommend it to somebody like me, it helped me achieve my goals. Those are strong positions for you to talk about the value and strength of what you're doing. And then there's a, these other insights we think about how do we, what do we do to improve our, in our continuous improvement efforts uh, is where Nicole is turning us to next. So thank right. you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's good to just point out that these don't always track together. And so that's why we do think it's important to capture those subjective indicators as well. Um, because just capturing income doesn't really tell that whole picture. Um, so Nicole, then, yes. Can I ask a question about that last yeah, graph? Absolutely. Please do. Let me go back. So the green line is meeting all three. So mm -hmm. this is the percentage that met all three where the, yep. the metrics are about 40,000. Yes. What, what are the metrics on the other two? What's the target? Um, yeah. So I, I didn't. Um, so the other two are whether people felt that their education was worth the cost and whether they felt it helped them achieve their goals. So the fact that you can see that the green and the orange are tracking pretty closely here um, means that really the income was kind of the, the weak link, especially at the beginning, because um, people, you know, as Dave said, there were higher percentages right out the gate who said that their education was worth the cost and they were, um, it helped them achieve their goals. So that wasn't mm -hmm. kind of what was preventing them from achieving all three. You must have had a target for deciding if someone achieved their goals. It was, so um, in this case, these are five point scales. And so it was someone who agreed with uh, those statements about my education was worth the cost. So if they either strongly agree or agree, 
and then the same for if it helped them achieve their goals, if they strongly agree or agree, and then if they're also earning at least that $40,000. How did you combine two Likert scales into a single percentage? Um, so, I mean, people had to have achieved agreement on both of those subjective ones. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so the next thing we looked at was some differences among, um, you know, different groups of students because we know that for access and completion, there are big inequities and we found the same for these beyond completion outcomes. So here you can see that students of color and first generation students and also female students um, were less likely to have achieved these different outcomes. Um, also, you know, there's a little more weakness for those who were recent graduates. Um, and then just to follow up, we also looked at if you were examining graduates who had achieved all three of the outcomes. And again, you see it accentuated even more, um, students of color and first generation students and female students being much less likely to have achieved all three of those outcomes. And this, Nicole, when we looked at this analysis, this was probably the most, one of the more striking revelations, I think, and insights yeah. we saw is female students, you know, more likely to enroll, to persist, to graduate. Their successes in, when it comes relative into their use and yeah. success within higher ed, but to see those inequities on the outcomes beyond completion, uh, just you know, that's something we need to understand more about and look at this data with you, but certainly in our dialogue and discussion today and ongoing, trying to know what that means and where we think that comes from, wage inequities in the market, all of those things, but that's striking um, to see that. And I don't, you know, Ruth, you had a thought earlier as we were looking at this today. I don't know if you want to, when we previewed this with you last week, anything you'd chime in on here? Well, I would say that um, this was a, a striking finding to me, um, given, you know, I've been working hard on completion, uh, certainly during my time at the University of Utah and, and watching female students outpace male students for quite a while, uh, nationally, certainly in completing the four-year degree they came for uh, within the six-year period. So very striking finding, I think, um, that when we look at these differences in achieving completion value and purpose, or in the broader sense, are we succeeding with our graduates beyond completion, uh, the gaps for students of color, first-generation students and female students really got my attention. I think the question of um, how much we know that through the pandemic, women have been disproportionate, disproportionately affected, um, as have students, individuals of color, um, and lower income individuals. So I think there is work to do here to better understand this and to understand what can we do about it. Um, but I, I think the finding that got um, my surprise, really the female student discrepancy is pretty, pretty striking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, some more that we're gonna be looking into, some of our past research has looked at outcomes by field of study. And so that's a possible, um, you know, something that could be behind this if female students are concentrated in certain fields of study that um, feel like they aren't getting the same kind of outcomes. I think that is, you know, one part of it, but definitely something for us to be looking into more. Nicole, mm -hmm. this occurred. Uh, the non-traditional students, is that age-based or? Yes, correct, good question. Yeah, so those are people who enrolled when they were over age 25 or age 25 plus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nicole, yeah, this is this is Valeria at the University of South Florida. Um, I put you actually as I typed you were as specifically talking about the the, the study, the major and profession yeah. field of study. But um, I'd also want to just kind of throw out there to see if we have a way to see the change of profession over time, mm -hmm. um, especially under with the female population. That would be an interesting um, further insight because we could mm -hmm. see that women are maybe changing their professions either due to um, in, in this case with the pandemic or you know just the shifts of, of the profession and, and if that has any impact to that yeah that's a really good point you know this survey only looks at what their current job is 
but I know our affiliate MZ has done a lot of analysis around you know, pulling LinkedIn profiles and things like that to study the progression over time and some interesting stuff about liberal arts graduates and the kinds of career paths that they pursue. So um, yeah, that would be interesting from a gender perspective as well. All right, thanks for your questions, everybody. This is great. All right, so the next step we wanted to look at was um, we see these differences and what are the tools that universities might have to try to impact these opportunities and these, these outcomes beyond completion. So if you guys have spent any time with your reports, you might be familiar with these different buckets that um, we put our questions into. So kind of holistic questions about value, life impact, career satisfaction, skill development, and affinity. So I'm not gonna go through all these, that's just where this is coming from. So then I was interested in, um, you know, which of these are most predictive of um, better outcomes in those three metrics that we just looked at. And so what I did here was just create an average score uh, for each of the items that are in these buckets. And what I found was that the most predictive was that career satisfaction. So if you create an index, you know, just averages of those scores, that is the, the factor that's most strongly related to someone believing that their education was worth the cost or someone believing that their education helped them to achieve their goals. So that, that was kind of the first step, um, but that's still a little bit unsatisfying, I would say, because you say, okay, great, it's really important that people are satisfied with their careers. Still, what can we as a university do on campus to try to help people achieve that career satisfaction. So taking it one step further back and looking at um, those lists of things that students found valuable on campus, um, there were really three main factors that we found that were related to career satisfaction. So the strongest one was um, things that I've called connection to career. So that was the items that were internships, career advising, career placement, and the alumni network and professional connections. And um, this isn't super pretty, this is just our you know, linear regression table, but you can see that um, for all students and then even particularly for students of color, these items are the most impactful for them being satisfied in their career. And then the second bucket was under academics, so alumni had rated the value of professors and coursework. And then finally, um, what I'm calling support. So that was student services. We had things like financial aid and registrar's office, and then also a sense of belonging on campus. And that we were able to borrow from Nessie survey. So hopefully that'll give us some good opportunities to do some analysis, you know, looking at uh, some of the things they've found as well. But it was the item about, um, I feel like part of the community, or I felt like part of the community on my campus. Um, so all three of those were strongly related to um, alumni then being satisfied in their career. Nicole? Yes. The item called academics, professors mm -hmm. and coursework, I, I, I don't remember the survey well enough. What was being asked there? What's that about? Yeah, so it wasn't really much more detailed than that. There was a very long list of uh, things and we said, you know, there are a number of things that students may have found valuable during their time on campus. Please rate how valuable each of the following were to you. And it was really literally professors, coursework, yeah. internships, career advising. So okay. they're all kind of, you know, asked to list the value of these things. And they had a not applicable um, option as well because a lot of people didn't ever have an internship. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so then this last one is just kind of going directly from those uh, academics. Well, here we're showing just the connection to career. And if you were to change that, this model is if you have a first generation female student of color, for example, and you change that connection to career, which um, would be on a one to five uh, range what the predicted likelihood of them believing that their education is worth the cost and that their education helped them to achieve their goals. 
And so you can just see that it's a really big impact, um, you know, between someone feeling that those things were not valuable and someone feeling that, you know, yes, I got a lot of value out of those um, internships or career advising, things like that. Um, they're just much more likely to um, agree with those ultimate outcome statements, that their education was worth the cost and their education helped them to achieve their goals. This is actually a finding that I'm encouraged by because we keep finding a similar thing across a lot of different research instruments. So we did a study um, in partnership with College Pulse last fall with current students and then um, and we found something similar to this with current students. Um, we've done it in our other uh, surveys with Gallup as well and we did it about feelings around student loans and so consistently we keep finding that when students feel that their college or university is helping them to make those connections to career that they're much more likely to feel that education is worth the cost. And um, you know, we've seen a lot of doubts in our survey from prospective students about whether or not that will be the case. So I think this is really um, something important that universities can do both for their current students and for prospective students as well is to make those connections really clear. Um, so the last, this is my last um, data slide and this is just taking some of those items that I said were in that list. So classes, professors, student services, and then below those connection to career items. So by and large, um, what we kept seeing is all of the universities perform really strongly on those kind of academic items. When we ask about the value of classes and professors, I'm willing to bet if you look at your reports that those are gonna be your strongest metrics there. Um, students tend to rate those, or alumni tend to rate those really highly. And then this, these are the national averages, but again, I'm, I'm willing to bet for many of you anyway, um, that those connection to career are gonna be quite a lot weaker. A lot of uh, alumni saying, no, I never participated, or you know, it, it wasn't really that valuable. So I think not only is it a powerful um, predictor of whether or not students feel that their education was worth it, but it's also something that tends to have more room for improvement compared to some of the other things that we see. That was, that's kind of it for the national data, just kind of to summarize. We do see a majority um, in that national data of graduates saying that education did help them achieve success beyond completion, that they're earning money and their, their education was worth the cost and helped them achieve their goals. Um, not as strong for achieving all three of those. And then we see inequities, just like we do for access and just like we do for completion. Um, Can I um, ask a yes, please. Sort of please, please. broader causal question about yes. whether or not this is a prospective or a retrospective mm -hmm. interpretation you're taking? I mean, it's easy sure. to say, you know, they had great, the student had a great professor and was able to get into a great job and everything was worth it from day one, so on and so forth. Yep. Um, but the other story is, once they find a great job, they reinterpret mm -hmm. the value of various experiences. Um, um, and we know sort of finding that right job may take a number of years. And I, I'm, just, I'm just wondering your sense of the causal directionality yeah. and also in, in responding, you know, there's a lot of advisors who talk about, <clears throat> you know, your, your major is really important, but not as important as you think because you're mm -hmm. going to have so many ex so many jobs and yeah. um, don't stress about the major. This report seems to be saying something different. Yeah, so so two things. First of all, I, <laughs> I've been, you know, better trained in data science than to ever say like this is definitely this is causal, you know, this is um, descriptive uh, data, this is not experimental data. And so, of course, we're looking at at correlations and it's not it's not over time I think it would be interesting um, to you know do some further research and like I said we have that that Nessie module so we're kind of capturing their more students um, current perspectives on it and it could be interesting to to find some different ways to get at that because you are asking people to look back and evaluate something now but we do think that there's something valuable 
that alumni bring in that perspective that you you couldn't get until you're a few years out of school and you really understand you know what was useful about your education and and what wasn't um, as much in terms of majors um, it's interesting because I it's not always straightforward as far as oh all the the stem majors have better outcomes or whatnot I think one of the things that we found in our other work was that it tended to be majors that had more of a um, I don't, I don't want to say necessarily practical, but for example, education majors, you know, who did student teaching and things like that, then they felt, oh, I got a really good um, connection to a career while I was studying. And so I think not even that um, you have to stay in the same profession your whole career because, you know, we know that's not what happens, especially for liberal arts grads. Um, but I think getting off on a strong start by having those experiences before you graduate and being able to, um, you know, just get a taste of what's out there and then having, you know, a strong launch to your career um, is always better than not uh, because, you know, that's going to kind of set the tone for the, you know, the rest of someone's career. And so Jane, I don't, oh, oh, sorry, yeah. Nicole. Oh, I was just going to say, I don't want to, you know, cut off time that we have for some of our, our other things, but go ahead, Dave. Well, I was just going to say, James and Eric and others, you're making notes at home and you're doing things in the chat. This is what we can learn together as a community, right? Mm -hmm. Strata has some resources. If we have good questions and you have access, let's think together beyond today about mm -hmm. how, what are the key questions and how do we solve them in productive ways that help lead to change. And I think that's really the beauty, uh, I, we are so appreciative. Courtney's gonna, we'll turn the time over to you, Courtney, with this panel to start thinking from an institutional leadership perspective, what does this help us do and what do we need to know beyond what we already have to do that? So, Courtney, you wanna pick up? Great, thanks so much, Dave. And uh, Courtney McBeth, I'm a senior vice president at Strata Impact as well. And uh, so great to be with everyone today. And I know uh, for all of our institutional leaders, it might be helpful to just know that we have leaders from you know, 30 plus institutions that are on today. And we have leaders that are in, sitting in alumni roles, enrollment management, um, institutional analysis and research, provost offices, CFOs, um, and student affairs. So uh, how great is it to have a cross-cutting perspective on how to best use alumni data to move to solutions and actions on campus? So. Uh, I'm really excited to uh, introduce today Chancellor Robert Jones. He's the Chancellor of University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We have President Stephen Corral, President of University of South Florida, as well as President Ellen Jun, uh, 11th President of California State University at Stanislaus. So thank you to you three for joining us. Your perspective is, is very important as your institution's been thinking about how to really leverage student and alumni data. So. Um, with our three panelists, let's start out just thinking about, you know, given we have this cross-cutting group of institutions and different types of institutional leaders, if you could just tell us, and maybe we'll start out with uh, Chancellor Jones, how do you see the value of listening to alumni perspectives and what can their insights and input provide to you as a leader to help inform what you're thinking about your institution needs to be doing? Well, let me start by saying, first of all, uh, good afternoon uh, or to everyone. It's indeed an honor and pleasure to participate in this critical discussion. Uh, from my perspective here at the University of Illinois at Banner-Champaign, alumni perspectives are very much uh, critically tied to our overarching desire to be best in class in everything that we do. And we feel very strongly that we have an obligation to deliver a world-class education to each and every one of our students. And uh, we have programs and strategies in place to try to do that, but we don't uh, think we do quite enough in terms of uh, the analysis, the data-driven strategies that need to be in place to help us best understand the lived experiences of our students once they graduate and uh, how that really does link back 
uh, to what we provide to them during the time that they're on our campus. And part of what we are doing here at the university is we have a very, very successful uh, destination survey, uh, first destination survey that provides a context for what our alums are doing within a year or two after graduating. And we're very, very pleased to know that that data does give us an insight that the majority of them are obtaining that first destination within six months of graduating. But the survey, the Strata survey is an important addition to what we're doing uh, to better understand the more long-term impression of the university and how we might shape those impressions by the type of things that we do all the way from branding and marketing uh, to uh, providing a perspective and opportunity for alums to share their insights with us about their lived experiences while on campus so that we can better understand and how we might shape programming on the front end to better serve them while they're here, but also how we can be more strategic uh, on a broader scale to serve those students once they graduate. We're very, very proud of the fact we have over 4, 475,000 alums who are committed and very interested uh, to uh, the university. And we just feel very strongly we have to have a multi-dimensional approach to them not just approach them when it's time for the next capital fundraising campaign, but how do we consistently reach out to them to understand their lived experiences, how the university is, is or isn't serving them well as alum. And so our participation is a very welcome window of opportunity for our alums to really learn how we can be more uniform and more impactful in terms of providing the type of educational experiences while people are enrolled at this university and what we might do is to strategically stay connected to them once they graduate, because uh, we just think this is critically important and very timely. That's great. Thank you, Chancellor. And President Jun, uh, just building off of that, how we use these data and um, to inform solutions and policies, tell us how you see the value of listening to alumni perspectives and input. Thank you so much. And I too wanna to say thank you for this opportunity and to be on this illustrious panel with uh, you know, both Robert and Stephen as presidents and chancellors. I have to start by saying that I'm sort of a walking advertisement for um, Strata because I first met Dave um, at a president's conference with the Ask You about four or five years ago. and. Um, the data that he was presenting also indicated that our campus, my campus at CSU Stanislaus is somewhat unusual in the sense that um, for my campus, we're located in the Central Valley of California, which is um, largely agricultural and largely economically underserved. So 75% of my students are first in their family to go to college, they're first gen. 66% of my students are female. That number becomes even greater when we talk about our graduate program. 75% of my students are female. So, um, and we're a minority majority institution as well. So the, the data from my campus are somewhat unusual. And so one of the things I was very interested in is to understand who our students are. And in particular, I was concerned about um, career projections and, and um, professional success because we have so many who are first gen and because in the central part of California, only 18% of uh, residents in central California um, have a baccalaureate degree. So the results from my campus differ from the national results insofar as the students who come to my campus and get the BA um, actually project them into much higher career um, salaried positions. And so uh, for that reason, my campus is among the top in the nation, we're ranked 17th in the nation with college net for social mobility, for example, number one in the West, um, uh, number seven in the West for social mobility, et cetera, with uh, US News and World Reports. So I was very interested to understand what our data was for our students. And um, so taking part in the Strata survey was extremely um, revealing. And it was perfectly timed because then again, what I was trying to do as when I came to 
Stanislaus is to um, provide greater support for students as they prepare once they have their degree to move into the um, professional career world. So we have a new initiative called Career Ready You, and the data from Strata was instrumental in helping us to understand how to better support our students, uh, both from an internal point of view of how to get our students career ready. And I can put our, um, our uh, link to our Career Ready You initiative into the chat, or maybe it's not chat, it's in, oh, yeah, it is there, so I can put that in for those of you who are interested. But I also wanted to connect our campus with our regional stakeholders. So um, we, I, this was just prior to COVID, we started, I started meeting with the regional CEOs of companies because most of our students want to stay in the Central Valley. So uh, as first gen students, they weren't sure where to find jobs. So now we have employers, we have about um, uh, 30, 20, 20, 30 uh, campus, I mean, um, partners. And in addition, we joined up with a cradle to career initiative so that we have other educational partners, K through 12, community college and so on. So we're really trying to build out a more robust systems approach to helping our students move into career uh, ready positions. And so the great news is the Strata survey uh, reaffirmed that 94% of our alumni said um, 12 to one that they would absolutely recommend in highest terms uh, our campus for other students into the future. And they saw 82% saw great positive benefits, particularly as some of you have mentioned in the chat, um, focus on how the faculty have been critical in helping students move um, you know, successfully into the uh, workforce, uh, classes, faculty, and so forth. So career development um, has been a major focus for my campus in the last year or two, and we're now rolling out our uh, Career Ready U to all freshmen in their new freshman orientation, as well as to new transfer. And we started as an opt-in, and this, this summer it'll be an opt-out so that students can actually, you know, start doing, building internships and other kinds of you know, uh, intentional behaviors into their um, semester schedule as they continue. So when they graduate, they have more than just a diploma that says I have a degree in English or I have a degree in, you know, um, whatever major they choose, but they have actually shown that they are building skills for using LinkedIn as well. So those are all having to do with career development. But what I would say, we're also using this strata data for two other areas and one is critical thinking, uh, critical skills development. So as you can see in some of the work that Nicole was showing earlier is that you can identify which skills that students are building that they are understanding will support them in their future career success. So in a sense, it also helps us reframe our GE thinking and the importance of GE in building those skills. And that's something again that LinkedIn is another partner of ours. Uh, is helping to help our students perceive what are those skill sets that we're learning, no matter what job they might be having as an undergraduate. The vast majority of our students are working as well as uh, finishing their courses. And then the final thing is alumni support. Uh, prior to my arrival, uh, there was a very nascent, if not dormant, alumni engagement program. So this has then spurred, again, um, greater uh, investment in hiring individuals to help create that uh, strong, robust, active engagement by alumni, which uh, as Robert says, is gonna be critical as we think about coming forward with a capital campaign, a comprehensive campaign for students to see the connection between their institution and for giving back uh, for the success of future generations. So upward mobility is something that is really key for um, our institutions at state levels to foster um, you know, greater success, not just of you know, the, our students, but their future generations of students. And uh, I, I see that the Strata survey has been, alumni survey has been very instrumental in at least those three regards, career development, uh, critical skill development, GE reform, and alumni engagement. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. That's wonderful. Thank you, President John. I appreciate the recap at the end. That's always helpful. Uh, President uh, Corral would love to hear your perspective on the value of capturing and understanding alumni perspectives. 
Well, Courtney, uh, thank you for uh, having me and thanks to to Ruth and I'm delighted to be with Robert and, and Ellen as well. And uh, Robert and Ellen have both uh, talked about different dimensions of the benefit of participating in the survey. Uh, so I'd like to add to that list. And one of the things that I found most interesting and most valuable for our work at the University of South Florida is uh, the, the findings around uh, the idea of support. So if you remember the results that uh, were shown by Nicole just a few minutes ago, uh, certainly the, the academic, the classes, the professors are really at the top of the, uh, the queue there in terms of, of impact on, on students and driving their responses to the questions. But then also below that, yet still significant was this concept of support. And that's, where I, that's what I found most uh, fascinating for the following reasons. Uh, when I arrived uh, at the University of South Florida, uh, we as a community launched, on a, uh, launched off on an initiative and an exercise to try to articulate what we mean by principles of community. So uh, the, the reason for um, proposing this was uh, um, multi-pronged. Multi one was to try to reinforce our commitment to diversity and inclusion, uh, freedom of expression, uh, accountability, transparency, um, and, and so on, and to re reinforce that as part of the culture of the fabric of the university. Uh, it, 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 the principles of community exercise was also intended to lay the groundwork for the process of strategic planning for the university. So these principles of community helped guide the deliberations. It, it, it provided parameters and uh, guidance for how we interact with each other, how we deliberate, how we debate, how we have a dialogue about the future of the university and do so in a very civilized and, and thoughtful and respectful way. So those were the, the, the two reasons for doing it. But then it's linked also back to the findings from the survey about support because that sense of community that uh, students feel while they're on campus is a concept that we need to extend out into their alumni experience as well. This has been a topic that uh, my colleague, Bill McCausland, who's with us today, uh, have been uh, speaking about and, and brainstorming about. Bill is the vice president of our alumni association. So, so our, our, our fascinating puzzle to solve now is how to take this idea of principles of community that students get exposed to when they're on campus and then extend that out into their relationship with the university uh, as, as they go into their careers and they, uh, they advance in that way. And so what we're trying to do is to find ways to um, um, reinforce those themes that, that are captured in principles community and apply that to the alumni community. And one, one thing that, that we're doing at the University of South Florida and that I've seen uh, done at, at my previous institutions is really try to connect people in terms of uh, career development. And uh, those who are either looking for employment or a career transition, or some people are actually looking to hire as well. Some people are employers and looking to hire and uh, um, I've, I've found in my experience that uh, events and activities that help build that kind of mutually uh, reciprocal reinforcing network among people who are looking for career transitions and those who have jobs is something that really pulls alumni into those programs. And I think overall reinforces this idea of community and makes it relevant, not just to have social events as, uh, as important as they are for alumni, but also to really have some programmatic activities for alumni that help them with their career advancement and career transitions. And I find that that uh, generates lots of enthusiasm among our uh, alumni communities. So those are just a, a few ways that we're using the survey findings to expand our thinking about uh, our alumni community and, and, and building this idea of community that extends all the way from the on-campus experience into the alumni experience. Wonderful, thank you, President. So on a very practical level, and Chancellor Jones, you touched on this a little bit, but we're in this wonderful era in higher ed where we are awash with data and we have a lot of data coming in. So 
how as institutional leaders, we've, we've heard a couple really good examples from each of you of how you've harnessed alumni perspectives and turned that into actions and solutions. Um, and we have, you know, 60 plus campus leaders here who all have daytime jobs and they're putting out fires. And so I, I, I want to ask maybe a little bit of a push a little bit. How how is institutional leaders collectively? How do we take these alumni data and make the time to really analyze and understand them and then move it into strategies, solutions and tactics that can really improve student outcomes? Well, I think that is the, um, the, the big question here and the big challenge and the big opportunity. You know, we like to pride ourselves on being a data-driven institution. We have a strategic plan that is framed and benchmarked uh, based on data and data analytics. And so now, as uh, was said earlier, I think it's high time that we look at the issue of uh, this data-driven strategy that Strata has implemented here as a part of how we think holistically about how we improve the student experience, as I said, on campus. And then how do we, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Corral said, continue to engage with students once they graduate? Because um, I can tell you that is absolutely needed in this environment in which people are starting to doubt in a very significant number the whole value proposition. And so I think the way that you do this is you have to institutionalize it the way we do anything else. We have to add this as a critical benchmark, as a part of our benchmarks about how we are succeeding and how we're moving forward in our critical uh, strategic directions. And I can tell you the experiences of our alums is at the absolute core. So uh, we think from Illinois perspective that this will build on our our, our student success initiative that is focused uh, primarily as one of the pillars of our strategic plan. And so we will institutionalize it using this kind of data by making sure we not only link in the provost's office, but student affairs and uh, the alumni office, as well as alumni relations to try to make sure that we can utilize this bad data to better understand how we engage with alums more effectively. This is critically important to us at Urbana-Champaign at this juncture because we're kind of doing a reset of our uh, University of Illinois Alumni Association. For decades, it was a system alumni association where uh, if you graduate from any of the three universities, you were a member of what we call UIAA. Now UIAA is just for graduates of the Urbana-Champaign uh, University. And so uh, under the leadership of Jen Delavu, we're taking a deep dive using survey data uh, to basically frame the strategic direction for our alumni association. That's a seamless interface with the typical outreach and engagement but also more squarely linked to our development and our philanthropy, and I might add our branding and marketing efforts as well. We think that one of the best ways is to integrate across all these different systems, because we think that the university is probably, uh, much to my surprise when I came here five years ago, one of the best kept secrets in America, and that we have a compelling story to tell that our alums are thirsty to hear. And in the short time since we instituted an office for strategic marketing branding, I'm willing to bet you if you were doing the longitudinal study that I think this study will provide, you will start to see market improvement in the perception of the person's value proposition back to the university simply because we're doing a better job of reaching out to them individually and collectively. And they're starting to see the University of Illinois and its story being told in a much more compelling way. So we see this as at the absolute core for our strategic plan moving forward. That's wonderful. Great, great example. And uh, Ellen and then Steve. Yes, I think um, as far as this having data, whenever you put data in the hands of faculty, 
um, they often find it very intriguing. And I think this is a way to kind of jumpstart that enthusiasm and interest and in not just the faculty, but um, all of our other constituency groups, the student affairs individuals uh, will look at this data and say, gosh, I wonder why students aren't as excited about coming to the Career Development Center, for example. And they'll find ways to partner and um, start looking at where there are you know, potential areas of improvement. So I think that um, having um, robust kinds of surveys, particularly of alumni, are very valuable and many institutions don't have um, the bandwidth often to do that in a regular way. So um, having this kind of opportunity is, is um, instrumental, I think, in helping to understand where our students are now and uh, showing the value proposition, as Robert was saying, uh, in addition, and Stephen using this for um, you know, strategic planning, uh, institutional strategic planning is key. So I think if you can frame it in that perspective, that um, it, it helps to energize campus and focus a campus about where our students are from when they came and where they are now and how to further improve the experience uh, for, free, for future cohorts of students. So um, as a you know empirical social scientist myself, just like Robert, we like to make informed decisions and starting with some data uh, actually for me is always exciting. And um, so that's one of the reasons that I think I have such strong um, positive reactions for Strata and the efforts that Strata is trying to do both at the institutional level and at the national level. That's great. And Ellen, you bring up a really important point that our research team talked about and um, the point around uh, career support and the key role in the academic category that professors yeah. play and being able to use these data as a, as a change tool with faculty mm -hmm. and their important voice, um, mm -hmm. we, we thought was significant and, and well, could be helpful. And I, I just want to say there is the caveat. I, when I initially started our Career Ready U initiative, uh, there are faculty for whom you, if you mention career, they um, get a kind of an internal negative reaction because their fear is we are not producing students that are widgets into jobs. We are here to convey the discipline, the love of the discipline as kind of a, an end in and of itself. And when they see this data and understand that their um, interactions with students are critical in having the students understand that, especially as first gen, the role of faculty in giving them motivation and a larger perspective of you know, mm -hmm. the workforce world ha is actually more powerful than what typically happens at a career development center. I mean, the data on the national um, student usage of career development centers, I don't know how many of you, when you were in college, ever went to the career development center. Nationally, it's only 16% ever go. It, every campus has a career development center. My campus did not. When I arrived, I was shocked to hear that it had been uh, slashed during the former budget um, era. So um, that's, again, giving the data and letting faculty and staff reflect on it from students who actually experience your university is um, kind of an aha experience and helps to reset and reframe um, you know, an institution's thinking about how to go forward. So that has been very helpful for us, is for the faculty to see, gosh, we do make a difference in students' uh, future careers mm -hmm. and without even knowing it. And so those things are, I think, um, very useful insights. Right, it's not an either or, but it's an and, and they play yeah. a key role in reimagining how we think about connecting education to employment. It's great. And uh, Steve, maybe you can close us out here, just your thoughts on how we take these data and move it to action and move to solutions. Well, um, one of the benefits for me in participating in this conversation is it's uh, fostering new thoughts about how we can um, use data and be evidence-based in our thinking about how to deepen our connections to our about 370,000 alumni here at the University of South Florida. And um, I'll just say a quick word of, of, of preface about uh, the, the Florida context. So the state university system in Florida is, is very, very much uh, metric and performance-based. So we have performance-based funding and a set of metrics around the concept of preeminence uh, in, in the state of Florida. And so we, we already have quite a, a robust infrastructure and that's actually led by one of my colleagues who spoke earlier on this uh, call, 
and that's Dr. Valeria Garcia, who runs the Office of Decision Support. So because of this, this history of performance metrics and performance funding, we had developed a very uh, sophisticated uh, system of uh, information system and individuals who are very skilled in, in data analysis, data analytics. Uh, and I think that the next uh, um, uh, opportunity for us is to use that infrastructure that we have in the Office of Decision Support and bring, bring a more a closer um, partnership with the Alumni Association and, and encourage our, our Office of Decision Support to now partner in new and fresh ways with the Alumni Association in looking at, at how we manage the data on our alumni and apply a lot of that uh, horsepower and muscle that we have in ODS to, uh, to understanding our alumni network. And uh, so this will be an opportunity for me to task Bill McCausland and Val Valeria Garcia, who are on the, on the call to, uh, to come together and, and forge a new uh, and exciting partnership in the way that we manage our alumni data. That's great, Steve. It's fun to watch you catalyze the teams in real time here as we build this higher ed community Delegate. data for action. I like it. That's great. Uh, well, thank you, Robert and Ellen and Steve very much. And uh, we hope you'll continue to participate as we uh, move on in our programming. Um, I'm excited to uh, turn the time over to our live case study. So I'll turn the time over to Mike Martineau, who heads up the University of Utah's Institutional Research and Analysis Office, and Linda Dunn, who heads up the University of Utah's Alumni Association, and they're going to give us a live case study of how they've used uh, Strata data to help inform uh, their approach. So I'll turn it over to you, Mike and Linda. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces, familiar names. Thank you for your time and joining us today. Um, Linda and I, so I'll just introduce myself and we'll talk through um, what we have today. I serve as the Director of Institutional Analysis for the University of Utah. Really thrilled about this Strata partnership and what we've done. Um, I've already jotted down a few notes and a few ideas to come back, so look forward to, to further discussion with you all. I'm, I'm thankfully joined by a terrific colleague and friend, Linda Dunn, and I'll let her introduce herself here. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm delighted to join with you and I've already, like Mike, been so inspired by the panel and just the work that's being presented. Um, I'm the Chief Alumni Relations Officer Interim at the University of Utah, and we've had a bit of a jump start with this data because we've had it for over a year. And what we're sharing as a case study has been um, such an opportunity to put into practice as much as possible the uses of such data. So Mike, back to you. We're delighted to quickly and briefly share with you some ways that we've used it. Great. As an audience member, I always appreciate knowing what I'm in for. I have a total of 11 slides for all of you. Many of those are transition slides, so don't worry. We're going to be brief, um, but really look forward to following up with some discussion. If anyone would like to contact me for further details, um, be happy to do so. Just, just put it in the chat, and I'll be happy to follow up. Um, a couple of years ago, which seems like decades now past 2020, um, in, in 2019, we partnered with with Strata, um, thankfully and gratefully, on helping to develop and helping to participate in this um, alumni survey development and, and administration. We chose to send it out to a relatively small sample of alumni. We, we administered it in late 2019 to over 15,000. We chose to send it out to bachelor's degree recipients from uh, 2000 through 2019. So we have nearly this 20 year window cross section of, of our alumni. Uh, we received over, over 600 responses, about a 4% response rate. Again, not, not the greatest something to work at, but across, um, and you can see there across many degree years across 38 different states where they, where they live now. Um, and as we go through this, that's a backdrop. I'll let I'll let Linda kind of tell us what our goal was and some of our approach with the analysis. 
You know, like many of you have already said, um, many of our institutions are in a process of reset and we are looking hard at what is relevant and what is measurable. And just at the time that this um, data came through Mike and we were looking at it, we were needing to really think about the, the um, things that our alums and also those of us that are trying to be relevant could grab onto. And we really loved, we kind of used a, a three C's because we really saw in this data that it really identified the value that we identified as the cost, that it had great value for our alums, particularly even as they further out that they got, that they saw the cost and the value, that that also was so tied with the career focus for them and that they had experience now that they could bring back and that this data has helped us then to kind of have the three C's of cost, career and connection. Um, and we have really, as we'll try to explain briefly, really used that, um, as Ruth said at the first, to help us reimagine and also you know, retool where it is we're going and help to change our institution. Uh, so the three C's of cost, career, and connection is the way we chose to frame the data. Well, we'll start with getting a strategic understanding of what this data is telling us about our alumni perception, which is the reality of how they view the university, how they view their lives as a function in part of the university experience was really critical. So knowing a particular metric, an average of a particular metric uh, for the University of Utah alumni was really important. Having the distribution, uh, many of you are, are familiar with box plots here, having the distribution of, of what our alumni telling us was even better, but having the national landscape really brought it to life. And so knowing some of these metrics with against the backdrop of a national landscape along those lines, especially institutions of our own type and size was really critical to really helping understand what, it, what are the alumni really trying to tell us with some of this data. Um, next, looking at some of the more Im important factors and, and metrics that we look at, um, like, like kind of the net promoter score, um, nature of was it worth it, was it worth the cost? Um, I, I just really love and admire the work that Nicole has done into diving deeper into what influences some of those factors. And of course, the, the direction of causality, I should have used you know, dual direction arrows there. Um, there's a lot to play out here, but um, us social scientists and data people really love to dive in and find relationships between those things. But more importantly, it's more than just you know, a, a digital report or anything, these insights really help us drive understanding and action in, in a lot of different areas that we'll talk about here. So we'll go through some of the strategic approach of how we've disseminated, the, disseminated these results and how we've coordinated some of these with, um, with our university. Uh, first, starting at leadership, um, of course, helping leadership understand both the president, the cabinet, and also the leadership within alumni, within enrollment management, help understand what's going on with these results. Linda and I then had the opportunity to, to present to our trustees, of course, an important constituent and governing body over the university about what are our alumni saying on a number of factors and what does that say about us? Um, we've then moved on to a lot of our campus partners, including alumni enrollment management, career services, which a lot of you have talked about today, and even touching on some curriculum um, efforts, mostly through committees and shared governance, of course, here at the university, um, talking through really what does this particular piece have for action in these individual areas. And then the two areas that we have that are gonna be boxes kind of future we're working on right now are sitting down with individual faculty within departments, colleges, and programs of saying, here's what skill development looks like through the lens of an alumni. Here's what you know data analysis skills look like rated for majors who left within your college. And lastly, this has tremendous implications on accreditation efforts. So a lot of our accreditation can be boiled down to, um, do you have mechanisms in place to verify and assess that you're doing what you say you do. And so having the alumni piece is something that we currently see as, as sometimes a gap within our accreditation efforts. 
it's an important voice to bring through in those accreditation efforts that we're, um, that we're starting to instill at the University of Utah. Linda, what else would you add here? So Mike, I just want to add to what you've said that this strata data has allowed us to be a bit of a, road, a, a show we've taken on the road. And, and I say the road around our campus because it's helped us to, um, Mike and I, to really go to these different audiences. We went to also our university marketing. Um, and as Mike has said, all these different elements. And we've, we've talked in these about the relevance of this data and how it's helping us collectively as, an, as a university, as an institution, to move forward with um, a, a focus. And it's just the more we've spoken this in different audiences, the more it gives us ideas. And the, the data really has helped set direction with groups. It's been kind of a common denominator and, and, and so valuable. As I said at the first, we've had a bit of a head start. And with President Watkins' leadership on our campus of a 1U effort, the, the strata data has just given us something tangible to move forward initiatives that are so timely. So to showcase a little bit of our of our roadshow, as Linda calls it, we're, we're going to go through a few just examples um, really quickly. And again, we're happy to dive in deeper. But here's some of the things we've presented to some of our campus partners. The first, the first C, of course, is the cost. And so a lot of people really want to know what are the perception of alumni on the cost and the value. And so we have this, you know, I think of this as a net promoter score. It, it was it was worth the cost. Um, it's really important for us to dissect this by degree year uh, for a lot of different reasons and some of those we've touched on but the degree completion to career transition really isn't a dichotomous one-time event it, it, it is a continuous event that continues to happen and the impact of a university experience continues throughout a person's life not only when they land their first career or first job and so to, to split some of these results, particularly this um, was my bachelor's degree worth the cost metric, splitting them by degree year was really helpful for us in understanding. And, and fortunately for us, um, you know, we have this really nice tight relationship. This is probably pretty consistent to a lot of your institutions, um, almost linear relationship between time and um, people valuing their education. So as people have had more time to reflect on the impact of their education, they've come to value it more. Linda, what would you add here? Well, I think we've kind of said that um, as we've gone, but we also want to just say that our university demographics and student population is ever changing. And to, to get a grasp of this and keep our eye on this, it needs to be a value. And we want alumni that have graduated to bring that message back for current students that they may end up mentoring or helping on that career path because the value matters. So we just really feel that this data is a very helpful message for our current students and for our alumni, and it's relevant. Uh, one more additional measure on cost is, uh, of course, debt. Um, being in very sensitive to college and university and education costs and debt load, it was important for us to present this to many different audiences of um, alumni's perception and reported um, levels of debt. Over half, so a slight majority of our alumni from this sample indicated that they earned a bachelor's degree debt free. Of course, this was an important message to understand. We have a few different metrics on this like for, for all of our graduating students. And so this is a very good temperature check on um, some selection effects of, of the alumni, but also how the alumni perceive and answer this for themselves. And then moving on to career, we, we have, I mean, there's, there's just so much data within this that, that Strata has helped provide us. Um, so we, we, we tried to pare it down and, and, and frankly, that's the tough part is paring it down to some actionable insights. But just on the broad topic of skill development, um, you can see at least for us at the University of Utah, there's just tremendous variance in terms of the individual skills um, through the perspective of alumni. Uh, of course, that, that, um, that question of my degree makes me an attractive candidate for employers is really tightly associated with a lot of these skill development. Um, but when you start breaking them down by individual skill, you can start to see what implications they have for different areas and different units on campus here. 
huge career alignment too, as career changes. So one of the ideas I've already written down, I can't remember who, who mentioned this, but asking about change of professions over time, particularly for females and female alumni, um, tremendously important as, as you think about what skills are important um, over time and what skills are almost emerging as more important over time. Um, really critical to break it down like this and then further break it down by demographics if you do have uh, sufficient observations in those in those groups. I, I kind of just add to this that, you know, as Ruth mentioned at the first, of course, our focus on access and our focus on graduation have been so critical these last years and so key, but really we are all realizing that if we don't graduate students and then help them with the employability, you know, those other things will be much less important. And this focus on career has really helped us to get more buy-in across our campus from everywhere from the obvious, our career and professional development center, but certainly we at alumni and every one of our college um, deans and then their people to really focus on what are we doing and how can we do this with one message around bringing back our alums that have had the statistics bear the idea that have had positive skill sets and careers and employability and bring that message back to our campus to current students and help them even before they graduate with mentoring around this. So it's given us a very tangible data to help move um, you know, an entire institution with more focus now, not just on access, not just on graduation, but really on the whole focus of Strata, which is helping the employability and the long-term success of our graduates. Well said, Linda. And so moving on to our last data slide and keeping in mind um, President Watkins' charge of, of moving beyond completion we have these last three questions, and, and I believe, Nicole, you correct me if I'm wrong, I believe these went out to everyone. I don't think these were the custom ones. Yeah, um, those, that's right, Mike. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So, so you all have these or similar ones. Um, th these were really, really telling, and I think these got the most traction with most of our audiences. And it's just a really, really, um, I think, innovative way of asking them, how does your connection look and feel right now to your university? And so, you know, you can go through some of this data. We have agreement, we have these, these scales, but um, splitting these by demographics, again, by major area, by degree year, by where they live right now in state, out of state, um, really, really fascinating. Some of them are associated with, with things like income and career satisfaction. Some of them are just kind of spurious. And so helping understand that connection these are really the ones that help us move to action with our university marketing communication plans, with our alumni strategy, um, and, and even with our with our career services and, and, and partners like that. We really loved that the final C was, as Mike said, an action and a connection. And at the end of the day, an alumni, we're really trying to find that relevance and connection to keep alumni coming back and engaging. And we're trying to promote students, our alums from day one, in the sense that we hope as they go across that trajectory that they will connect and find such affinity. And this data is very helpful to us to feel secure as we really continue to market this and hope that it really does bring this full circle and that we not only do it, but we do it now, um, you know, critical mass that we can get alums at large numbers and students engaged in um, using this data to really make a difference and, um, and get our alums and students feeling the importance of all that they're doing that we're here to support that employability and career that is the purpose of their higher education degree and this data so has helped us give more support and focus on that well th thank you all this is our kind of ending slide we have some additional uh, things in our back pocket as all well, if anyone wants to open up for for questions but again thanks for your time here thank you very much Great, I think, I think we're going to Ruth now to wrap us up. Thank you so much. And I was actually already doing that, but I was doing it on mute. So thank you, Courtney, for jumping in. Um, wow, what an inspiring conversation. I wanna encourage people to uh, 
write a question if you like in chat. Um, let us know that you want to ask a question and we'll pick up on it. As we do that, I want to say, um, if we don't get to all those questions, we will respond to you personally and have a dialogue. So Chancellor Jones, President uh, John and Corral, leaders, uh, Mike and Linda, all of you on this participating today, you are all leading a movement beyond completion. Whether you knew you were doing that or not, you are, because every one of you has said, we need to value and use the perspectives of our graduates, our alums in institutional improvement. We need to know more about what happens to students after they complete and leave. And in fact, our students, their families, our industries, the public is demanding that of us. This movement beyond completion starts here and you're leading it. How, what a wonderful and inspiring dialogue. Um, love to see uh, questions or comments that people want to bring up. Uh, Mike and Linda willing to answer any questions that people have. Um, what's on your mind? What would you like to know before we sign off today? Um, Mary Kay, are you still here with us? I, I am. I, yes, go ahead, Mary Kay. Um, I had just put in the chat, so I've been asked to present to our cabinet next month. So vice president, president, um, athletic director, chief of staff, the folks you would expect, uh, on strata and MC uh, information uh, that we've been gathering uh, this year and last year. So I was curious from the cabinet level folks on the call in the room, if you're sitting in the room with me, what generally speaking would you want to know um, in the in the 10 minutes that I have in front of you about, about this information? You know, I could offer a comment or two because um, I was in my president of the University of Utah chair when we did this presentation with a cabinet and also our trustees. And I will say uh, the trustee conversation was wonderful. They were so excited about the fact that we were asking these questions of our graduates and trying to imagine institutional improvement from the lens of an alum. What did we do well? What did we not do well? And so I think you, you can be very open along those lines but you want every person in your cabinet room to think, what does this mean for me and how I should think about my work every day? So I think it inspired an, a, a great discussion in both with the cabinet and the trustees where everyone left that discussion thinking, what is my role in this? What is my part of helping make change? I, I think um, President Jun gave a wonderful example of an entire redesign of career service and delivery to orientation or the beginning of the journey with students. What a powerful insight for the people in the cabinet that have a stake in how does orientation work? What are we doing about career as students come into our institution? So I think it probably helps to lead that 10 minutes with that cabinet on what can you do about this? What's your role? in this change. That, that's kind of what I would put out there. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Uh, Chancellor Jones has asked about disaggregating for international students. And Nicole, I don't know if you want to jump in there. It's a great question because we yeah. often know less about what happens with those uh, alums. Right. And we were really sensitive on the survey about not wanting to ask about nationality or citizenship. You know, we didn't want to put anyone off with those um, questions and so we didn't ask about that on the on the survey however um, we did ask alumni if they gave permission to link their responses back to your student records and so if they did give that permission and it was sent out and if they responded through the unique links at the beginning then you would have the ability to do that um, as you know we, we also ended up at the end sort of sending out a universal link and so again it sort of depends if they then followed up with their contact information Ruth, can i no. just make a brief comment yes. yeah well I, I appreciate knowing that because um, as ruth well knows this university is one that has a large very very large international student population and while we know that the survey and the data reported is generally focused on 
uh, U.S. student or domestic students this thing. But the international piece, I think, is an increasingly critical component because we're very actively trying to establish more uh, uh, structured physical alumni contacts around the world and having a better idea of their lived experiences and how we link them more effectively you know, post-graduation to the university and for a person and for an institution that's really high on global engagement. I just think we would should try to find some way to allow people to just check off whether they are, you know, are domestic or international student. Don't know what the right term is, but get an aggregated sense of their experience, lived experiences, I think is going to be critically important as well. We'll take that, Robert, as a strata assignment. So thank you for that. And Ellen, maybe we're going to let you have the last word here. Oh, well, let me just add, you know, I appreciated the presentation by Utah. And so um, Linda and the Mike, um, the one other thing that you might add is another constituency group that I found quite surprising in, in sort of my discussions about this with different audiences is the legislature. Uh, elected officials. And the reason I say this is because whenever I've talked about this sort of career initiative, um, the legislators and uh, sometimes even the governor will get very interested because particularly now with COVID, as, as um, we come out of COVID, the interest is in what happens with the job sector and how to regrow and re-energize and restart the economy uh, in the job sector with our graduates as well. Of course, this is a this is data from our alumni, but that also is um, a powerful area. And parents, don't forget parents. So parents, um, you know, I have colleagues who'll say, gee, I wish my son or daughter had this kind of career ready you initiative when they sent their kids to state institutions or elsewhere um, because they hadn't necessarily prepared while they were still an undergrad uh, to hit the job market um, strong with a sort of a more filled out resume. So those are two other um, audience groups that you might also consider as powerful, um, you know, uh, on, you know, uh, stakeholders. So thank you so much, Ellen. And thank you all for the inspiring ideas today. Um, it is great to imagine our next step of the journey as we all begin to think more beyond completion for what we are delivering for our students, our graduates, and our communities beyond, um, beyond completion to full value throughout life. Kylie, there might be a wrap up uh, element that you would like to add before we sign off or as people are jumping off. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Keep an eye out on your emails for tomorrow. We will be sending out just a quick follow up, um, which will include the recording of this meeting and then also some resources from today's presentation, so. Thanks so much. Have a good day, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you.